Today we are going to study the priesthood of Aaron. And before we we come to understand the whole setup of why God instituted this office of priesthood of Aaron, we are first to consider this office of priest. Was it there before? Yes, it was there. This priest office has been there even before Aaron. It was an office which was occupied by the firstborns of the children of Abraham or the children of God ever since. Those who are the firstborn were the one who are serving this office of a priest in the family. For, for example, we are going to consider some of the things or some of the verses which might help us or might make us to understand that truly the priest office was there even before the priesthood of Aaron. First, we are going to study Exodus 28 verse 1. And it says, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliazar, and Idama, Aaron's sons. You can see Aaron or Moses is directed to make Aaron or to put Aaron to serve in the priest office. Which means this office was there even before Aaron became a high priest or that office was given to Aaron. We can also learn something from Exodus 19.24 which says And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. You can see, even before Aaron was a high priest, there were priests which were together with the congregation of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So that shows that this office of the priest was there even before, even before Aaron became a priest. So then, we are going to see how did it change hand. We can get that one in this verse. Numbers 3.12, which says, And I, behold, have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. That is the time this uh, office changed hand from the firstborn to the Levites. That means this priest office before Aaron or before the Levites were given that charge to serve in this office was served by the firstborns. So we can see that this priest's office has been there since the fall. Since man fell, this office, God knew and God created that this office that it should be there because this office, as we, as we are going to see, it is the office of mediation. So then, why did God change this office 
and to the Aaron priesthood. The reason is simply this. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt going to Canaan, this was a type of that spiritual salvation. That's, that was a type of that salvation of our soul by our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, God wanted to magnify this office of priesthood because in actual sense, Christ is the high priest of our salvation. So at this time, since this was a type, he wanted to magnify this office. And that's why, we, as we are going to see, this office was magnified through Aaron so that we, or those people who were there at that time, could actually learn or God could teach us the work of our Lord Jesus Christ in his work or in his office as a mediator, as we are going to see by and by. If we are going to understand how God magnified this priesthood of Aaron, we are going to get it from Exodus 28 verse 1 up to 39. We are not going to read them all. You might read them at your own time. But I'm going to point some few. For example, let us hear, let us read Exodus 28 verse 3, which says, starting from verse 1, that is Exodus 28 verse 1, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadam, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Idama, Aaron's sons. Verse 2 says, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And verse 3 says, and thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garment to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. From this we can see that all the decorations which were done unto Aaron's garment were God-inspired. It is God who, who had signed them. That through them, we, the children of salvation, shall understand the work of God or how or the work of Christ or who is Christ. So their deep spiritual teaching. That if we study them slowly one by one, they might give us a lot of understanding of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which is, which is very sweet or very good for those who are hungering and thirsting for, for, and for righteousness. It is good for us then to understand all these uh, decorations, though we are not going to, to study them one by one. Uh, it is for you, those who are the seekers of the truth, to actually try to understand them one by one so that they may grow in knowledge in all ways. In Exodus 28.40, he says, And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them giddos and bonnets, shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. In this verse, we can see that this priest office Aaron was to occupy with his sons. This means that Aaron, the high priest, as a type of Christ, the sons are types of the elect of God, as we are going to learn 
as we go along. There's another verse I, I want you to put in mind. That is Exodus 28 verse 29, which says, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. As we have said, Aaron being a type of our Lord Jesus Christ, we the elect, we are ever in the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ when he, when he entered at the throne of God. Those things, we are going to see them or to expound them as we are going along and we are going more and more to understand them and see actually what all these things meant. They are for us to understand them. And first, we are going to see or we shall take notice of the laws relating to the person of Aaron and his sons. Whosoever he was that approached to God in the character of a high priest, he, behoo he behooved according to the law of Moses to be of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron. His genealogy well attested, his body sound, his life temperate, for he was not to drink wine or other intoxicating liquors. His wife must be either a virgin or the widow of priest, but by no means a divorced woman or an herald. There were many laws relating to this office or priesthood, but just point some few in Leviticus chapter 21, like verse 1 which says, and the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, or the priests, priest, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. In verse 7, he says, They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband. For he is holy and is God. In verse 9 he says, And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. These are teachings of deep spiritual truth that we, the elect of God, we should not have any communion with any sin in our lifetime. We should be very careful how we or how we take this life or how we commune in our daily life with this world duties. I'm not going to expound them all at this point, but I want you to see that the priests which were a type of the saints or the elect of God, all these prohibitions, they are well uh, illustrated in our New Testament doctrine. If you look them carefully, you will understand all these things in their true setting, why these laws were put there. And in Leviticus 21.10, there was a law for the priest which says, and he and he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garment, shall not uncover his head, nor red his cloth. Verse 11 says, Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself, for his father or for his mother. Verse 12. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary 
nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. This shows that there is a difference between the high priest and the priest. The high priest was not to come out of the sanctuary. The high priest was before God all the time. So this strictly shows that the high priest was our Lord Jesus Christ who is before God all the time and there's no one time he will ever or he has never left the sanctuary because he's with God at all the time. And if you read verse 13, it says, And he shall take a wife in her virginity. So, who are these? Who are the wife of our Lord Jesus Christ? The church of God. The true church of God is a virgin. And that one, we can get it uh, in the following verses. That is, Matthew 25 verse 1 says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So those who form the kingdom of God, they are virgins. That's why the high priest was to marry virgins only. Also, we have it in Revelation 14 verse 4. These are they which were not defied with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lab with the swever he goeth. These who are redeemed from among men, being the first fruit and God unto God and to the lab. All these verses and many more shows why, as we have said, the high priest in the Old Testament was only to marry a virgin. All these verses we are studying or we are looking so that we may see that this office of a high priest or the office of the priests was inspired by God to teach us all these New Testament truth that we are seeing or we are learning through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in actual sense, they were representing Christ and his elect. The high priest was taken among men, especially among the Levites, and especially from the family of Aaron. Like Aaron, he was taken from among men and was an Hebrew of the Hebrew. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And never any priest of them all could be boast of could boast of of such illustrious pedigree as Jesus Christ. The genealogy of the ancient priest behooved to be firmly documented. But they had no such illustrious proof of their being the sons of Levi, as Christ had of his being the Son of God, which his father attested both by voice from heaven and by the mighty works he enabled him to do. If you read Leviticus 21 verse 17, it says, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Verse 18 says, For whatsoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfurious. So the soundness of their body was no doubt intended to prefigure the integrity and perfection of Jesus Christ in his soul. For the least deformity here had rendered him utterly incapable 
of propitiating the deity by the sacrifice of himself. For such an high priest became us, who, though falsely accused of many sin, was never convicted of any, but was holy, harmless, and defiled, separate from sinners, and allowed without blemish and without spot, even in the pure eyes of God. When you read Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8 and 9, it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So the abstinence from wine and strong drink, which was commanded, was not only designed to inculcate the strictest temperance, which is a most necessary virtue to the discharge of any important trust that requires the faculties of the mind to be in their most figurous state. But it may be also viewed as an implicit intimation of that perfect command of himself which our high priest had in the discharging, sorry, in the discharging of his office, never forgetting what he was about in the smallest instance, being always found of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. But by no means he was perfect in all ways. In Leviticus 21, verse 10 and 11, it says, And he that is a high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor red his clothes, neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. What does that mean? The prohibition of going out of the sanctuary to mourn for the dead was a prediction that when Jesus Christ should pass into the heavenly sanctuary, he should leave all his sorrows behind him and dwell forever in the presence of God, where there is fullness of joy. Moreover, it clearly signifies that he was to abolish death and the grave. Therefore, let no tear be shed for the blessed dead who die in the Lord. The most calamitous event to the eyes of sense is to the eyes of faith the most happy revolution in the Lord of the just. The law of the priestly garments was no less instructive and significant. The curious materials of the effort of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, might represent the unsearchable riches of Christ and the luster of those defined graces which adorned his sacred humanity. The names of the twelve tribes he bore first upon his shoulders and then upon his breastplate as a memorial before the Lord continually, engraven on precious stones and disposed in comely order is no obscure emblem of the saints whom our high priest carries both on the shoulders of his almighty power and on the breast of cordial love, according to the most pathetic prayers of the spouse. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. These names were engraven on precious stones, for such are all his saints. Though disallowed of men and trampled underfoot, 
as not pebbles, yet are they chosen of God and precious, and they shall be his in the day that he make up his jewels. No tribe was wanting in that most costly breastplate, for Jesus Christ knows them by name whom he redeems, both the great and small, and there is no respect of persons. They were arranged in a calmly order, for he is not the God of confusion, but of order, as in all the churches of the saints. They were firmly set and not slightly put into the breastplate, for all the faithful are so firmly united unto Jesus Christ that not the smallest jewel can be picked from the breastplate of our Aaron by the joint effort of earth and hell. It was not lawful for the Israelites to enter into the most holy place in their own persons, but in the person of the high priest. They entered every year as their names were graven on his shoulders and heart and presented unto Jehovah. Even so, in Jesus Christ, the holy Christian nations who live upon the earth are entered into the holiest of all and even set down with him in heavenly places. In Exodus 28 verse 30, God says, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Ulim and the Dumin, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. It is hard sometimes to understand some of this divinely workmanship of Urim and the Dumin, but what we know or we are certain of, however, is that in Jesus Christ, we have that priest who stands up with Urim and Thummim and bears the judgment of Israel before the Lord continually. In him are found the clearest light of wisdom and the greatest perfection of holiness. In him, that prayer is fully answered. Give the king thy judgment, O Lord, and the king's sons thy righteousness. Christ judges righteously. And we, the elect of God, we should be right here and we should also judge righteously through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Exodus 28 verse 8, it says, And the curious giddle of the effort which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of of blue and purple and scarlet and the fine twinned linen. This curious giddo signifies the alacrity wherewith our high priest discharged every part of his office for gilding up the loins of his mind he did with all his might what is hard found. Aaron's giddo was indeed of costly texture, gold and purple, blue and scarlet. But of Jesus Christ it was prophesied, faithfulness shall be the giddo of his loins, and righteousness the giddo of his reins. The beloved apostle John beheld him equipped with this priestly ornament when he saw him in the visions of God walking in the midst of the seven golden candlestick, clothed with a long white garment down to the foot and girt about the pub with a golden gadu or gido. The golden bells suspended around the hem of Aaron's under robe may signify the sweet sound of the gospel which is gone into all the, all the earth. Blessed are the people who hear this joyful sound, 
sweeter to the ear of faith than music in its softest strain to the ear of the body, an undoubted sign that our high priest is alive, though we see him not, and lives forever in the presence of Jehovah to make intercession for us. In Exodus 28, verse 33 and 34, he says, And beneath, upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about, a golden bell and, and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the road, of the rope round about. What does this mean? The pomegranate that were curious road betwixt the bells or between the bells and equal to them in number may be an emblem of those fruits of righteousness with which the preaching of the gospel is untended. The golden bell here represents the sweet word of the gospel and pomegranate is those fruits or the gracious fruits in our soul which are brought by that word of God through sanctification. If you read Exodus 29 verse 6, it says, And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. This, the fair mitre that adorned his head, or this is the fair mitre that adorned his head with a venerable inscription on the plate of gold surrounding his temples, may put us in mind of Jesus Christ, who is the only crowned priest, and not only holy, but holiness itself and the Lord. Yeah, he is himself the holy Jehovah and fountain of holiness unto his people. For this is the same whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Such were the garments for glory and beauty the typical priesthood were commanded to wear, and such their mystical signification. Let us come next to the manner of their consecration. The Hebrew lawgiver is directed to bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, where they were washed with water, arrayed with the priestly vestments, anointed with the costly oil, which it was death to counterfeit, and lastly, sanctified by the offering up of peculiar sacrifices whose blood was put upon the extreme parts of their bodies. Though every minute circumstance in these venerable rites may not be pi sorry, may not be capable of application to Jesus Christ, it is sufficient if we can observe a general analogue. Aaron was washed in water to signify that he was before polluted. And Christ was baptized, not indeed because he was himself polluted, but as it became him to fulfill all righteousness. Aaron was arrayed with the appointed vestment, and Christ was clothed with the garment of our flesh. Curiously wrote in the lower parts of the earth. Aaron was anointed with the oil, wherewith the inferior priests were but sprinkled. But Christ is anointed with the Holy Ghost, which God gives not by measure unto him. Aaron was consecrated with the blood of beasts, but Christ was sanctified by his own blood and made perfect through suffering by which he learned obedience though he was the son of God. The different parts of their function is the last thing that demands our attention. Every high priest taken from among men in the manner above described 
is ordained for men in things pertaining unto God and to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. This indeed was the most distinguishing part of their office and fundamental to all other functions that are appropriated to them. However, they were also appointed to bless the people, to pray for them, to instruct them in the knowledge of the divine will to oversee the service of the tabernacle, to blow the trumpet both in peace and war, and to judge betwixt the clean and the unclean. But we see Jesus, our high priest, giving himself an offering and a sacrifice of sweet-smelling savor, more graceful unto God, and more appeasing to his incensed justice than all the victims that ever smoked in the worldly sanctuary, or than all the gifts that were ever presented there, or than all the incense that ever fumed from the golden censer. Put off your robes, ye legal priest, your work is finished, your office entirely superseded. What you could not do by multiplied oblations, Jesus Christ has done by one sacrifice. The veil is now rent and the temple now destroyed. The shadow has given place to the substance. Those who call themselves priests today or are still burning incense are mistaken. They are still dwelling in the shadow when the substance who is our Lord Jesus Christ is already come. Jesus is that priest whom God has sent to bless us, who prays for his people, whose lips keep knowledge to instruct us in the will of God. Jesus is that priest who oversees the service of the tabernacle, being head over all things to the church, which is his body. Jesus is that priest who now blows the great trumpet of the gospel and who shall descend shortly from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God to gather the congregation of the righteous then all who have him not for their priest to wash and sprinkle them with his hyssop and blood shall have him for their priest to pronounce them utterly and clean let us close with Paul in Hebrew chapter 4 verse 16 which says Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen.